So we want to welcome Martin Woodward today. He's um, a commercial diver. He's been diving since the late 60s, uh, saturation diving, deep diving, um, and shipwrecks and salvage hunting. So tell us a little bit, Martin, a little bit. Welcome, first of all, of course. Thank you for joining us. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the saturation diving, maybe, because I know a lot of our listeners will have heard the term and maybe seen bits and pieces um but what's actually involved in being a saturation diver like being in that little dive bell for like 28 days at a time with with a hundred other guys you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would have been bad if it had been that many but um yeah i mean a lot of people have the misconception that you know when we're living in this chamber complex which which is what you live in. You live in a, 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 a sort of complex of chambers joined together and the bell is locked on the side, but the, the bell is locked on the side when you want to transfer under pressure down to the seabed. This is for your listeners, by the way, who, who don't understand it. Um, a lot of people think that the, the chamber complex is actually on the seabed, but it's not. You know, it's built into the bilge of the ship or, or the bottom of the ship. And uh, it's wow. made these days nowadays you know i mean they, they've got massive chambers in the in the 70s when i was saturation diving it was all very embryonic it was uh, you know you were almost guinea pigs but um in the early 70s it was it was, it was not very good statistically because a lot of people got lost inevitably in, a, in, a, in a, a sort of new technology that was kicking off um but that was the nature of the job in the mid 70s it started getting a lot better so the chambers we had on the I, I worked for uh, seaway diving which was stock nielsen um a norwegian company brilliant company they were really good and a lot of good guys work in there and uh, fairly small ships the dsvs the diver support vessels were, were, were relatively small by comparison to today um so you know you went out there on these things and, and the, the chambers we had we had one chamber about 10 foot by seven foot on one side of the, uh, the, the ship and a 10 foot by seven foot uh, on on the other side with a like a sphere in the middle which was the toilet the uh, tup transfer under pressure which linked onto the bell so you got in there at the start of your 30 days and um well initially you know in the early days we used to do two weeks on two weeks off and 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 it all sort of leveled out to a month in the chambers and then a month off um if the job went well that is so you climbed in there and you you pressured up um down to whatever depth you were working at be it 400 feet 500 feet uh, i've got to talk in meters now what's that 160 meters or something or 150 meters whatever depth it was and then you would remain at that depth for your 30 days and, and basically you'd have a, a decompression on the end which would be rule of thumb 100 uh, 30 meters per day per 100 foot so if if you were in down at um i'm still thinking feet and meters uh if feet's you were, fine feet, feet's yeah, fine martin yeah 500 feet you'd do a five day decompression at the end so you'd you'd finish your stint and and you'd gradually decompress for the five days now when you went to work i mean we worked back to back so you'd have four divers in the other chamber I mean, it's much more luxurious nowadays, but there were four divers in a 10 foot by seven foot chamber, approximately, and four divers in the other chamber and the and the TUP in the middle and the bell lock on. So you'd work back to back. They'd go out, uh, two two guys would go out in the bell and you'd, you'd go down to the work site. The door would pop when you reach the equivalent depth, water depth as the inside the uh, chamber depth, helium oxygen, obviously, mixture depending on uh on what depth you were at we were on, often on eight percent oxygen 92 helium or it might be a bit a, a bit less like five percent 95 um so then when you got to the bottom you'd go out and theoretically uh, in those days you were supposed to work uh, an eight hour bell run so the bell would go down to the seabed for eight hours the two divers would change over after four hours theoretically <laughs> i remember doing about 14 hours once and we did some quite long bell runs um 
And uh, then you'd change over, and the bellman would come out and do his dive. Then you'd go back to the surface and and uh, change over with the other the, the crew in the other chamber, and then you'd sleep. Uh, you so, know. Martin, is the is the bell hanging from the ship? Yes. Yeah. And it's, so, is the surface movement having any effect on the bell? Yeah, it is. It, it is it, not now because they have a device now where the, you know there's a dampening device where the bell stays pretty constant. But in those days, we were going up and down at the same height as the swell. And I remember uh, uh, recovering a lost ROV once up off the Brentfield, up um up the north of the Shetlands, about 150. Miles and the weather was appalling for seven weeks. We were stuck out there for weeks on end. And I, I managed to get this um, ROV that was wrapped around the bottom of the rig and I was trying to tie it to the bell weights when this <laughs> bell was going up and down about 10 or 12 feet. Wow. But, but you you learn to adjust, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm not one for dramatizing. Sometimes it had its moments, but you learn to adjust. And the thing about saturation diving, you know, I mean, I when I first started diving, you jumped over the side and it was all very very primitive and uh and you know you jumped over and you went down to the seabed you did your job and you came back but the thing about saturation diving which is good is that you've got someone on the end of an umbilical in the bell um you've got a bellman in the bell you've got the surface support up above um so you're in communication all the time whereas a lot of the early work i did we didn't have any communication whatsoever you know it was, it was before the days of surface supplied um hose diving and a lot of the time we were you know we were jumping over the side with scuba in the in the early commercial days so so what was the actual work you were doing what what did your day consist of um well you as i say you'd you'd work anything between eight and twelve hours on the seabed depending on the job and depending on the urgency but it, it, it you had to be a, a multitasker really i mean all the guys that i worked with some some had their little specialities some were very good uh, underwater hyperbaric welders um a lot of people were cutting but you had to have a, a cross section of skills to actually fit in because if you didn't have those cross section of skills you you wouldn't be the first to get in the in the pot if you know what i mean in the chamber because if they had a job where it involved you know cutting piles or you know maybe blowing a wellhead or or um you know um construction work bolting things up uh for one of my uh, little niche things was photography i did a lot of the photography close-up photography video photography of damage and things but you had to be able to do everything. I had to, uh, I had to be able to cut, you know, um, oxy art cutting and, and uh, you know, underwater well, well, wet welding. I, I was not a hyperbaric welder. There, there were some really good guys that specialised in that dry welding, you know, where they set up a habitat and then pump it out and the, they uh, do coded welding inside. But you, you, you had to be a bit of a, a multitasker. And to be quite honest, you know. I went to the North Sea after the Middle East and I worked for a company called McDermott's out in the Middle East. And, you know, you were expected to do everything. And if you didn't do it, <laughs> you know, as bad as it was, you know, and there was some, there were no HSC regulations or anything. If something had to be done, you had to do it. And again, I'm not exaggerating now. I've got lots of uh, examples of that. You'd be on the next crew boat back to the port and another diver would be just waiting to take your job. So you got on and did it. But when I went to the North Sea, you know, it seemed to me after some of the stuff I'd done before, like civil engineering, diving and everything, that, you know, the North Sea, OK, you worked hard. And, you know, if, if you can handle the confinement, which wasn't a problem for me, I didn't have any problem with that. You know, living in a chamber with three other blokes for 30 days. Talking like this, you know, oh, you passed the captain, clean me, I'm a <laughs> you know, if you can put up with that for 30 days, then you're fine. And uh, and it, 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 to me, it was, you know, the, the luxury of having communication and hot water pumping down to your suit. I mean, obviously, sometimes it went off in the early days and you nearly froze. But um, what sort of gear, you're obviously touching there and you mentioned it earlier about the technology is much yeah. more advanced now. Oh, but yeah. in those early days, what sort of gear were you using? So what diving, were you actually, did you dive in things like CB Gormans? 
No, no, no. The, um, the only time I ever dived in CB corners, and as you know by what's in the background there, I've got quite yeah. a few quite a few hat, old uh, C.B. Gorman hats and pumps. Any time I ever did that was right in the early days on one of the first jobs I ever did uh, in way back in Forley Refinery, I think it was, and they, they were still using C.B. Gorman um, stuff, but it was phased out very quickly in the 60s because, it, you know, everybody was doing the same, you know, they jumped into uh, into scuba gear. And the, the job we did in Forley was clearing these horrible ponds ready to put these tanks in and i think the last time the cb gorman gear was used in there was when someone put the compressor too near the edge and it went in <laughs> so as a punishment everybody had to wear wet suits after that and, it, and, and this was winter time but it was uh freezing cold uh but no in, in the north sea we were uh, on wet helmets uh kirby morgan tens at that stage I'd used eights before that, but tens are a wet helmet. But same ba sort of band mask, you know, that um, um, you see today. But they're obviously dry helmets now. They're they're you know much much more advanced than they were then. I've got some of them actually, and uh, you know I collected uh, these helmets over the years. I don't know if you had a chance to look at the video with some of the uh, the, the thing I sent. Um, and it was basically a. It was a loose fitting, quite thick suit, a suit, but it was a wetsuit which pumped hot water suit, uh, hot water down from a hot water machine on the surface, which was fine when it worked because it was quite comfortable. You know, I mean, you had hot water going around you. I mean, it's cold down three or four hundred feet under the North Sea or five hundred feet. It's pretty cold down there, and you, that's when you found out is when the hot water machine packed up. <laughs> it happened quite a few times, or maybe it'd get too hot and you you get a couple of blisters or something but i was quite, just going to ask that if it ever went the other way and got too hot and you, yeah, you just confirmed yeah. that yeah it did um not that often uh it went off a few times and you know the old bravado kicks in then if you're uh, out doing a job and you don't want to be a, you don't want to be a wuss you just put up with it <laughs> and then you go back to the bell and hope, hope that the water machine uh, kicks in again. But to be quite honest, all those things after after the Middle East and after civil engineering diving and early diving, you know, it was the good thing was that the boats were all fitted out in, in that mid seventies era, fitted out by the by the um, the divers that were working on board. You know, nowadays it's all done by technicians and everything and LSTs, the life support te technicians. But in those days, you know, you were working with a really good group of blokes and there's still a lot of them around. You know, we still get in contact. There's a, a website uh, on Facebook, which I'm not a fan of Facebook, but there's a good website on there where some of the old guys have all made contact again and share pictures and everything. And fortunately, I took a lot of pictures in those days uh, because I was doing the photography out there, you know, the underwater photography amongst other things. But I was also keen on photography. So I'd, I had loads of pictures that, everybody nowadays 40 years later is are desperate to have because most of them are lost theirs or they didn't have any in the first place um so a good bunch of blokes and we had a great camaraderie you know when you think that uh, a lot of people working together and you had to get on with people if you didn't get on with people they wouldn't put you back into saturation again you know if you fell out with someone or you were being a pain that's it you're you're not put in the pot again but and everybody wanted to do the job, you know, because, you know, if you get five saturations in a, a year, you know, that was good money in those days. You know, it was incredibly good money. Not that, yeah, I was never particularly motivated by the money, but it was nice, you know, to actually do it. So what was the, the safety record like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this was pre-HSE. Uh, HSE didn't come in until 82, I think it was. Uh, and, of course, 82, we'd been diving, you know, deep, and saturation dive for years so they couldn't say to us oh you haven't got a certificate you've got to go and do a course so <laughs> basically we got the grandfather clause that we had to send in our log books um in 82 and and they would just automatically sign you off because you've done sort of hundreds of dives saturation dives and other stuff um safety wise the early days of the 70s i mean i had i lost a few mates but i always look at it like this you know the the how many mates have you lost in your occupation, in, in my case, in diving? Um, or how many mates you lost in road crashes or motorbike crashes? It sort of, 
it's relative, really. I mean, there were a lot of losses. I've got all the newspaper cuttings filed away here from the early 70s where, you know, they were losing divers like nobody's business. But once that saturation diving kicked in and got understood, you know, in the mid 70s and it was all starting to improve, then the incidents sort of decreased. I mean, we had, you know, I mean, it's like anything, you know, I come back to car thing, you have close scrapes in the car. We had close scrapes and, you know, the, the perfect example of that is, I think I mentioned to you before the about that um, video, The Last Breath uh, video, you know, that, that that was an incredible thing. And thankfully, the modern technology and ROVs watching and the, the guy uh, thankfully survived and uh, a, a, a good thing. But in the early days, before GPS dynamic positioning of the ship, um, they were quite unstable, you know, the, the dynamic positioning was in the early days and they had seabed, seabed transponders which were could be interfered with bubbles. So you might be working on a, a wellhead or a pipeline or something and all of a sudden the, sh the ship would take off because the transponders had, had uh, gone erratic and you'd be dragged off along the seabed. So, yeah, I mean, I can remember a few things where we got caught, you know, one time we got caught up in the bottom of the rig um, when the ship went off station, you know, and we were caught up in a, a, a wire with my old mate, Rue, um, from Australia. And we were anchored, anchoring the ship to the bottom of the rig because this bit of gash wire got caught around the top of the bell. But, you know, it's all relative, you know, we all have scrapes through life. And I wouldn't swap it. You know, I would never. Uh, I would never not do it again because here I am. You know, I was diving two days ago, as I said to you, and uh, you know, groping around, Stevie Wonder diving, I call it. <laughs> so um, how did how did deep saturation diving on oil rigs and things like that? How did that turn into shipwrecks and salvage hunting? Is that because you saw things while you were down there? No, no. What we saw, uh, you know, it's amazing how it varied, actually. Sometimes the visibility will be rubbish, but a lot of the time in the North Sea, the the vis was um, was pretty good. You know, oh, it might be dark at that depth, but um, you saw a lot of big fish, ling, that came and leaned over your shoulder and, and were watching what you're doing, cod and all sorts of things. But to answer that question, I was I was – into shipwreck diving before I went to the North Sea, before I even went to the Middle East. You know, I was always keen on it because I was lucky enough to grow up at Bembridge, where I am now, you know, same place, right on the seafront where, you know, I could go out snorkeling on the ledges as a kid and, and uh, you know, rummage around. And it was always that that little boy in you that, that you want to find something. It doesn't matter whether it was valuable or not. It was just whether you actually extracted something from the ocean that had been there a, a fair while. And um, so I was always, uh, you know, really interested in shipwrecks. I all put together all this research, you know, even when I was pretty young, I was only about, well, I was only 19, 20, 21, you know, when I was commercial diving first. And uh, I'd sorted out all the records of the local wrecks and I'd, in my time off, I would just go and, uh, and play around doing it. But it never went away because even when I was away working, when I came back, I would use my time off to go looking for wrecks and shipwrecks. And I was fortunate enough that, you know, because we were well paid in the in, in the in the early days of the North Sea and Middle East, then then I um I bought the the kit. I bought a magnetometer, which was unheard of in the seventies, you know, and and it. it produced a lot of uncharted wrecks and things that uh you know i wouldn't have found without that gear and having the money to buy that gear if you know what i mean but I, i've always had a passion for shipwrecks and i still do i mean i still go out and do it now you know people all my old north sea mates say oh you're too bloody old to go but uh, you're not you know i mean i'm still fit <laughs> and uh i'm still i've got all the kit so why not go and do it and um you know i've got a lot of good technology on the boat that you, you can virtually see a rope on the seabed now well, so there's no yeah. reason not to do it but the in the early days you know you obviously didn't have uh, in the very early days i'm going back to late 60s early 70s then you know we were i was working for a um the first diving company i worked for 
was uh, run by a, a chap called Commander Joe Brooks, and he was quite famous. I only discovered lately that he was actually on the on the other team, on the the diving team of the Buster Crab thing. You know the Buster Crab story, the when they were spying under the Russian ship in 1956 in Portsmouth Harbour, and Buster Crab disappeared and drowned. Well, he was on the other team, and this was the owner of the company that uh, I worked for in 69, 70, 68, 69, 70, whatever it was. And uh, he had all these weird contraptions that he'd developed. He was a clever bloke, but he'd had his legs blown off in an accident when he tried to uh, throw a charge over a, a shark when he was in the Navy. Uh, they were doing an exercise down off the West Country, and uh, the shark came under the boat and blew the boat up and killed a couple of people, and he lost his legs. But... I had a tremendous amount of respect for him because he, when we were working on the pipelines, we were doing the, uh, the maintenance work on the pipelines in the Solent back in 69 or whatever it was, you know, in, in the black, uh, you know, in the middle of the shipping channel, there were ferries going over. It was all hair and scaring. He would pull himself down. He would take his legs off, <laughs> put, a, put a, a, a sort of a, a shorty wetsuit over his stubs, <laughs> pull himself down the line to see what we were doing. And he, he would be there, you know, amazing guy. But he, was, he was on the on the other team on the Buster Crab thing, and that only came to light lately. I didn't know that at the time. But, uh, you know, he had he developed all these contraptions that uh, he called them mobiles, and that's where the name Mobile Marine came from. And it was like a, it was like a sledge thing, in the, you know, that, they towed behind this old converted catch yacht that was, we were using as a work boat. And you, you, he said, you've got to get in it and breathe off the onboard supply, uh, some cylinders inside with DV, you know, uh, the, uh, regulators off them. And you get in there and the thing will go, poof, straight down to about 100 feet and your, ear, your eardrums will be bashing, you know, and, and everybody said, no, we're not doing that. We're not going in there without another cylinder on the back that we can bail out. And But... You know, some of the kit worked, and little tiny sort of submersibles that you climbed in, you know, a little thing called a guppy and things. Oh, I'm trying to wipe it all up because you couldn't make it up. You, you mentioned about uh, finding wrecks off of, of the Isle of Wight. Yeah. You actually found a submarine, I believe, that shouldn't have been where you found it. Is that right? Tell us that story. Yeah, that was um, the HMS Swordfish. And that's very close to my heart, that one, because... You know, I found a lot of wrecks in my time, and um, you know that, that there's a few that stick out. Now, this, 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 the swordfish went out of Gosport in 1940 to take up station down off the Western Approaches, down off Brest, off the west coast of France. Now, she was um, an S-class submarine, quite a big one, 600 tons from memory, and um, she steamed off. And because of radio silence, because the Germans were uh, around that area they would uh, they would not communicate with the submarine that they were relieving they would actually um just get there on a pre predetermined time so she was she went off to um relieve a, a submarine called hms usk down off breast uh and they always assumed that she got there um because the usk came back and then they never heard from the swordfish again and it turned out that because the German destroyers had done some depth charging a few days later on the 16th of um, November 1940, after she got down, it was supposedly got down there, they assumed that she'd been depth charged and, and lost with all the crew. Well, I was looking for a, a wreck. I was systematically searching the English Channel off the south side of the Isle of Wight. And I call it mowing the lawn. You know, you track up and down with the sonar and magnetometer. And... Um, I came across this uh, image, you know, and I thought, Phew, that looks like a submarine. It must be a U-boat because in my researches, there were no other British submarines there except one that had been scuttled, you know, which was the upstart, um, scuttled as a target, you know, like a sonar target. So I went down and sure enough, it was a submarine. And, and fortunately, the visibility was pretty good because you, those of you who have dived around the Isle of Wight, it's not good visibility around here at the best of times. But that particular day in in June 1983, it was uh, it was good visibility, and and I saw this ton conning tower stuck up, um, and then I went and scraped off the telegraphs in the conning tower because it didn't look like a U-boat to me; it looked more British design. And sure enough, it had Chadburn's 
um, slower head. They were slower heads, so they were obviously doing a trim dive, which they did just to adjust the trim of the boat uh, before they'd come up to the surface and uh, steam off down channel um, under cover of darkness. You know, unless they had to dive. And uh, she got mined. She got. Uh, she hit a German mine which had been laid uh, some time before. Um, blew her in half, just forward of the conning tower. All the crew, um, sadly, uh, died. You know, but it, it laid to, it laid to rest a mystery because they they never knew where the swordfish was, and they always assumed it was two hundred and fifty miles away. <laughs> I didn't know it was there. I found it by accident. So. How long did it take to establish its identity? You couldn't have known immediately. You know it's a British sub because of the telegraph, but you wouldn't have known which straight away, would you? Same day, basically. I, I got home and I got a collection of um, Jane's fighting ships, you know. And the periscope standards on the S-type submarine were quite, um, you know, they were quite recognisable. I knew, I knew it was British. I knew it was Second World War. And on the side of the conning tower, there were some bronze letters and on the seabed there were some that had fallen off and there was a w on there and an s and there were only two that it could be uh with an s and a w in and that was a seaball from the swordfish and it was it, it, it had to be the swordfish um and the the poignant thing about that is that you know we had a memorial service or the navy had a memorial service in in gosford in the church over there at the at dolphin um, the submarine base and um, in November 83 that's only a few months after I found the wreck and 235 people relatives turned up at that that mm. service of, for a 40 crew that's six people mm. for each crew member 40, 40 something years later so it was it was you know it was a poignant one and the, the wife of the telegraph telegraphist that was lost on there uh, was someone called Kath Morgan, right? that was um, her remarried name, a lovely lady, and she came to the museum every year until she died. She mm -hmm. used the little display we had on the swordfish as a memorial because she'd never had a, a place to wow. relate to the, her husband's death. And she was a lovely old lady. She died uh, when she was about 95. She always used to come down every year and see us and send things, you know, knit things for my kids and things, you know, so... Yeah. Lovely. It's a lovely story, and it, it's in all the wrecks that I've found, and I found a lot of uncharted wrecks with that having the kit, you know, and, and obviously uh, the actual naval surveys that, uh, were related back to 1955, and they were only steaming a thousand yards apart with a depth sounder, so they missed an awful lot of stuff. So I found over a hundred, I think it was over 150 uncharted wrecks over the years. Wow. Uh, but that still remains one of the most significant ones, that and the, the Mendy, you know, the one with the black troops on board. We've read some stories about some of the quite incredible things that you've been looking for, like um, Glenn Miller's aircraft, <laughs> the, the Lost City of Atlantis, which yeah, a lot of people try and find, or Goering's Gold, Francis Drake's Coffin. I mean, yeah. you're, you're looking for some crap. How do you get involved in stuff like that? to start with and tell us about it <laughs> okay it's it's word of mouth really because people knew that i had the passion for doing it and and you know why not is it, when you go down to any wreck or whatever it is doesn't matter how old it is i've got some stuff here you know to show you in a minute that uh, some of it's hundreds of years old some of it's decades old but you're the first person to actually touch that you know, since it went down and you don't know who the last person was and nobody has seen that before you have. Now, that's a very special feeling and it's not about the monetary value. I mean, I've worked with the American treasure hunters in Florida and various other places in the world and they drive me mad with this gold fever because, you know, gold's a lovely thing to find, but, you know, it, they don't have an appreciation of the history behind it. No, and no item is... To me, you could give me a gold coin, but it, it, it's worth, it's not worthless, but it's the, the significance is the story behind it and the history behind it, which relates to every item you find. Um, but, you know, to answer the question, it's, it's word of mouth. People knew I'd been sort of doing that stuff a long time and I, uh, the methodology I used was probably quite successful. And, um, you know, it's a small industry, so people 
approach you to to go and find stuff for syndicates or consortiums elsewhere now i've always been one to for a bit of fun and uh you know it's not all about money in fact some of the jobs i've done you know along the way abroad you know what some of the ones you've mentioned i haven't done them for money or i haven't charged them a consultancy fee i just do it for fun you know they they pay the expenses then i'll go and do it um and that happened in a lot of cases francis drake's coffin well uh, i met a guy called um called michael turner in fact i bumped into him on a cruise ship i was lecturing on a cruise ship a couple of years ago three or four years ago and bumped into him after many years and that guy knows more about francis drake than francis drake knew about himself and um and that's true you know he he he'd been he was a teacher from somerset and uh not francis drake but the other guy <laughs> um, and um close by though not far from plymouth um and uh he had gone everywhere that Francis Drake ever went in the world. He used his teacher's wages to fund going off to wherever Drake had been in the world. And he trod the same footsteps. You know, it, amazing, he, incredible knowledge of it. And he said to me, he said, I, I want to go and look for Francis Drake's coffin, the lead coffin, because it, it reported that he had a, a lead coffin, which, um, you know, this had uh, suddenly, I, I said from the start, it won't be a a proper lead coffin it'll be a box made by the ship's carpenter and just sheathed in a bit of a tingling what they call tingling lead that they use for patching underwater uh, lead sheet and i said they'll chuck him in there they would have chucked him in there with a couple of personal possessions and then nailed this lead sheet over the top so basically you're not going to find anything except for maybe a couple of bits of lead sheet mm -hmm. um, and it was a fairly vague sort of story of three miles off portobello off panama anyway i thought oh that'd be a bit of fun i said I, I and as long as i've been honest with people i won't take anybody's money uh, you know and 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 as i said i do a lot of it for fun anyway you know just for expenses but i'll always be honest about what i think are the chances of finding it same with the glenn miller's airplane which i'll tell you about in a minute so they still wanted to go ahead with this and they got some backing to go and have a look um down off uh, uh, you know uh, go and have a meeting over there and um i still said you know wasting the time you're not going to find find much at all if any you won't find anything at all uh, but we went out a meeting in florida and and the people involved out there were a bunch of charlatans and i thought oh dear no i don't like this and it never went anywhere but when i was i was on a i think i told you about flying i was on a, a trip um some years later and i actually dived on the spot off portobello off panama where it was just to see what the seabed was like and see if it would have buried anyway but it, it just wouldn't happen i mean it, it you know they had they had visions of a hermetically sealed coffin well if you're a 53 three year old pirate like old uh, drake was and you're on a little tiny ship you're not going to carry a, a, a hermetically sealed coffin in case you die in case yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's not room for one thing so it would have been it would have been a, a quickly knocked up box when he died you know he was only 53 but he died of disease and he'd uh, he'd had a successful uh, but it was fun and i enjoyed going over to the meetings about it and uh, and and then we get to the same thing applied with glenn miller's aeroplane now that was a different story because that that really interested me and i and i said to the guy that the old guy sadly now dead a californian lawyer who loved mysteries and wrote about that and D.B. Cooper, which is another one he got me out on in America. Um, uh, and he'd, he'd been following Glenn Miller, he was a Glenn Miller fan and and he just wanted to do this job. And I, he came to England. And the funny story is that it was just after the Edinburgh operation and uh, the HMS Edinburgh, you know, with the gold bars, which sadly I was laid up, I couldn't go, I was offered a job. but. Um, I did the next couple of jobs and I was in contact with the people that set up a thing called Consortium Salvage. Um, a good group, a good bunch of guys. And uh, when this uh, guy, old Richard, the Californian lawyer, got to England uh, on his quest to find someone to look for Glenn Miller's plane, he picked up the yellow pages and looked up salvage companies and found Consortium Salvage. He phoned them up and said, I want to go and set up a search for Glenn Miller's plane. Uh, can you help me? And they said, no, it's not really our sort of thing, but we know a man who will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
let me just get rid of this phone. Hang on. Um, and uh, anyway, he he came and saw me, and um, uh, we talked about it. And I said, look, you do realise that. The, the plane that Glenn Miller was um, flying was, or flying in was um, was a, a canvas and wood, um, you know, small aircraft called a, a Norseman, a Nordwin Norseman C-64A, a little bit like a Lysander, you know, only a light single, you know, a high wing monoplane, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, there's, no, there's going to be absolutely nothing left of that plane after all this time except for an engine block. And maybe a propeller. maybe a propeller so you're looking at some for something this big in the you know this big in the middle of the english channel you know not very big a pratt and whitney engine um i said the chances of finding that are probably thousands and thousands to one against he said well i still want to do it <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a lovely guy this story and all the other ones sound like all of them could be sitting in a pub on a Sunday afternoon, a couple of divers saying, should we go and look for Glenn Miller's aircraft? <laughs> yeah. A couple of miles. Yeah. You know, if yeah. we don't find it, if we don't find that, let's go and look for Atlantic. We can end the day saying, yeah, but we know better than anybody else where it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I said to him, I said, look, I, I love doing research. You know, I, I, and that's part of the fun for me is doing research. And, and looking into it and, and putting together all the all the pieces of the, of the jigsaw puzzle, if you like. So I said, I'll tell you what, this is the deal. I said, I'll I'll do the research for you for nothing. And I said, and if at the end of that research, I still say you haven't got a chance of finding it, um, then it's your decision whether you want to go ahead with it. And I did the research and oh, you wouldn't believe all the the uh, conspiracy stories between behind Miller's lost, you know, uh, you know, and there were some right charlatans along the way that said they'd found the plane with the, the pump, that the tires were still pumped up and it was sitting on the seabed off uh, Boulogne or somewhere, you know, there are just to try and con some money out of someone. There's a lot of people like that around. And at the end of it, I said, look, I said, you, the chances of finding it are, are just so minimal, it'll just be a waste of money. But, if you want to have a go, I'll do it, and I'll I, I'll go down there with the boat, do a survey, and I will only charge you expenses because I like these little jobs. Um, and it's not about money at the end of the day. Anyway, we went down there, and there, there was a very good uh, documentary made in 2001 called Glenn Miller's Last Flight, in which we took part in that, and uh, and it was it, it was a good documentary actually. I mean, it was uh, it sort of went into the history a bit. And the story was, which is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the 100% story. I forget all the others. I've done a lot of research into it, and all the other stories are just, a lot of them are nonsense. But there was a squadron of 138 Lancaster bombers that took off on a raid to go and bomb the railway yards at Siegen in Germany. And the, they couldn't get fighter cover because the weather was iffy. You know, it was, it was bad. And where the fighters were taken off from, it was really bad. They couldn't get off. Daylight raid. So they got over um, over Belgium and were, were told to abort the raid because there was no fighter cover and daytime raid too risky. And they came back and they were carrying these uh, these uh, huge what they call cookie bombs. They're like a huge um, you know forty five gallon drum twice over if you like four thousand pound bomb, which are pressure activated bombs. So they couldn't bring they couldn't come back and land at the airports were too risky with a full load. They had uh, oh, in let's see. Yeah, incendiaries, incendiaries, uh, thousands of incendiaries and these cookie bombs. So they were told to go to the southern jettison area in the middle of the English Channel between Beachy Head and um, Dieppe, or Boulogne, um, Dieppe, I think. Uh, it's right in the middle there. And they said, go back there, dump your bombs in the middle of the channel. Well, you know, thousands to one chance, Miller was coming the other way. In, a, in this little airport, uh, airplane, this Nordwind 60, C64A, took off from Twinwoods Farm in Bedfordshire, uh, got a lift over because he wanted to get over to organize the Christmas concert for the troops, you know, to boost their morale um, in Paris, you know, when uh, it had been, this is December the um, 15th, 16th, uh, 15th, 1944. So it was all taken off over there. 
But sadly, he was um, with a quite an inexperienced pilot who was an instrument rated, and it's only a little aircraft, and he just got a lift with this sort of really colourful um, colonel called Colonel Basel who was going over to fill up his champagne bottles and get a bit of black market stuff, apparently. And um, he strayed just slightly off course because the, the the wind just pushed him off course into the jettison area at the same, at the same time that the Lancasters were dropping their bombs and uh, he was at only about 2,000 feet, 2,500 feet because he was seen by uh, some of the Lancaster crews. So I spoke to some of them. We made a little film with, uh, got a, a little film made with one which was used in the documentary and very credible people, you know, a meticulous navigator. He saw Miller crash in the sea and he recognized the aircraft because he trained on that same aircraft as Canadian aircraft in Canada when he was training. And uh, so definitely happened. Uh, the, the, the safe altitude for a cookie bomb to be above it to, for safety is 4,000 feet minimum. And Miller was at about 2,005. And all these thousands of incendiaries, little incendiary bombs were dropping down at the same time. Um, and it, they either went through the control surfaces of the, air, the aircraft, only a light aircraft, uh, or the pressure bombs exploding above the surface just knocked him over and it, it just turned it over and crashed in the sea although you didn't find francis drake's coffin and obviously you wouldn't find glenn miller's aircraft what fantastic things to be involved in and experiences exactly to to tell us about well exactly and that's what it's all about life is not about constantly making money i've never been one for being driven by money i mean yeah it's nice to get have enough money to get through life but I would never turn down projects like that. And the, the thing is, he was such a lovely guy. And we went down there, we searched the northeastern uh, section of the um, drop zone, you know, the Jefferson zone, which is where I calculated from all the tracks and the navigational instruments and uh, the, uh, the navigational information where it was likely to be. But there was so much debris there. Uh, it was just no, I was picking stuff up every five minutes, you know, with, with the magnetometer and, and there were these brittle stars which built up on the seabed. So if the engine had been there, it would have been, uh, you know, it would have been probably buried in brittle stars anyway. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the classic one for tongue in cheek is, uh, is the, the lost city of Atlantis because I was, I was plagued, uh, you know, for many years. Well, not plagued, but a very persistent researcher into the lost city of Atlantis and he had a lot of knowledge, a Australian, a Greek Australian, and he would phone me up just constantly about going and setting up an operation to look for the lost city of Atlantis. Well, I'm not a, I, you know, I believe that probably Atlantis did exist and when whenever I do a lecture on the cruise ships, you know, which I, I do quite a lot, I, I add that in because it's it's, and I always ask the audience, you know, how many of you think it exists and how many of you don't? It's normally about a 50-50 split. Yeah. That's, and uh, and where, where is it, though? There's so many rumors yeah. as to where it could be. Yeah, the information that, um, you know, this guy had, he'd, he'd pieced together all the, the movement of the continents and, you know, the, the great, uh, depending what, on what um, date you believe, uh, there was, uh, you know, the Mount Atlas explosion, which uh, an earthquake, which was, I think, 10 times greater than Krakatoa, you know, when Santorini exploded in this uh, Mount Atlas in 2300 BC, or if you believe the other date, 1600 BC, according to the geologists um, and, and um, historians. Um, so what he said actually made sense. Well, what I managed to do, I'd, I'd had quite a good year that year, and I thought, oh, I fancy doing something a bit different. So I thought, he, you know, he, we organised to, to, to charter the Greek government's scientific research vessel, which was sitting in Piraeus and not doing very much. So I funded it, and um, uh, we went out and, and had, had a survey off um, Santorini, where he was convinced it was to the northwest of Santorini. And I said to him on the way out, I said, look, don't get your hopes up. You know, I'm a realist. <laughs> and and the chances of actually finding something, you know, in my mind, are not great, but it's it's really worth having a go. But he had visions of us going out there and sticking the sonar and the ROV over the side and seeing these 
gold-plated roofs and buildings uh, and, and uh, yeah uh, he's a nice guy but you know and, uh, I knew, I knew I wasn't going to be disappointed because I was half expecting not to find anything. But he was really disappointed, you know, when we got out there. We found big bits of mountain that had been blown off by this volcanic eruption of Mount Atlas way off shore, you know, the big pieces of rock that can only have come from that explosion. Uh, but we didn't didn't find it. But it was it was good fun trying. And uh, he still phones me now, you know, with the thing. It's, it's fun, the same as... Same, same as D.B. Cooper, Richard, the guy that initiated the Glenn Miller search, had written a book about D.B. Cooper. Now, if you ask any English people who D.B. Cooper is, the very few will ever know who it is. Every American will. Every American will. You're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, he was the most famous skyjacker mm -hmm. that ever existed in the Americans' eyes because in 1971 on Thanksgiving Day, he hijacked a, a Boeing 727 and uh, and demand, landed at, uh, at Seattle, demanded four parachutes, $200,000 in, in cash, uh, and um, and uh, took off again. Uh, and they didn't know where he was going to go, whether it was Reno or Mexico or anything. And he jumped out over Portland, Oregon. <laughs> he obviously knew what he was doing because, you know, I've done a bit of parachuting and... Uh, and he knew exactly what he was doing because he, he he asked for four parachutes. He was probably ex-military, you know, maybe ex-special force, I don't know. But he had a very convincing looking bomb in his briefcase. He knew the exact flat settings that uh, he wanted the 727 pilot to. Uh, he said, I want 15 degrees of flats and want you at uh, 10,000 feet and you'll go on this heading. And then because uh, the 727s had a, a lowering belly gangway, which they stopped after that because a couple of people did copycat uh, uh, hijackings, uh, same thing. It had a, 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 a staircase that went down from the belly so you could wind it down, you know. So good old D.B. Cooper, who's, that wasn't his name, obviously, um, he climbed, you know, told the stewardesses, uh, he, he, they got all the passengers off in Seattle, by the way, for, for first and just took off with the crew and him. And he wound it down and jumped off. And, uh, you know, it, well, he's a, he's a folk hero over there because he got away with it. He's never been caught. Several people have professed to be him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this Richard wanted me to go out there and dive in the Columbia River because there was some of the money found identified as some of the, the hall found on the riverbank there and uh so i said yeah i'll come and do that expenses only <laughs> so that that money was found that was 2008 or nine was it? yeah Martin, so, it wasn't back in 1970 they found no, no, no a boy called ingram so ingram found it he right. was just having a picnic there and he was just digging in the sand and there was a couple of bundles now my theory on that you know richard this is where we disagreed 100 percent because he was convinced that uh, db cooper landed in the in the river and and drowned you know and and his body in the money bag would still be there and i said well the chances of that are about ten thousand to one because a you know if he if he landed in a river with his obviously experience you know i've done a bit of parachute i could land in a river and survive um and he, you know, he was obviously a very experienced parachutist and first thing that you do is dump your thing and even if you went under you know the, the air trapped in the canopy that you know, it wouldn't happen you know basically um he would have been found or his body would have been found you know because it would have come up with the decomposition gases in a few days and so i said to him no way did he go in the river but he said well the money was found there i said well that doesn't make a difference i said if you read the story uh when he was just about to jump out he bagged he'd used one of the other parachutes to wrap up all the money and tie it to himself in one of the chutes. He wrapped it all up in the cords and jumped out. But he kept two two bundles of notes out, two big bundles, and put them in his raincoat. He had a raincoat on, apparently, and um, and put them in his pocket. But he said to the stewardesses, look, this, these are for you because I've caused you so much problem. They said, no, we can't accept that. So he stuffed them in his pockets. And I reckon that if he did land in the water or if he landed nearby or whatever, they, they may have dropped out, and that's what that money was because there was only – a small amount found i've actually handled the notes but it was great wow. fun we, we I, did, I think i did it three times i went out there and dived in the river because he kept wanting me to do it 
and he was a lovely guy you know he, he, he loved a mystery and he wrote a little book about it and you know what fun at the end of the day it's yeah. all fantastic like you say it's not I mean, it'd be fantastic if you could find something for any of these stories. And, and But it's just the fact that you've gone and done it and been involved in it. It fascinates me. Yeah, yeah it's it's fun, you know. And really, you know, I've been fortunate in life that, you know, I, I had the diving career and the, uh, and the good time in the North Sea when, you know, we were earning silly money out there. Um, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I've, if I never found anything again, I've had far more than my fair share. And uh, that's what we're behind us. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we'll, a, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, what I'd like to move on to, Martin, 50 years of being under the water, still doing it even this week. But yeah. there's another side to you of being on top of the water. And we've got... Um, oh, no, no, no. We're not going there yet. I want to know about Goering's gold. We're not letting him go before we speak. No way are we getting on to anything else till we talked about that. Well, <laughs> okay. yeah, Goering's gold, that was only recently. It was only 2013, I think it was. And uh, a good mate of mine um, who manufactures uh, electronics for finer stuff and does a lot of survey and also another mate of mine, which was his ex-son-in-law. Um, there, there was this uh, this guy that um, you call, he was Israeli, but he he specialises in hunting for Nazi treasure. And the story was that in a place called Lake Stolpsy, uh, just south of um, Berlin, uh, there was the story that when Goring was just about to do a runner because the Russians were on his doorstep, you know, and they were. You know what they would have done to him if they got him. And he'd had a hoard of gold coming from all sorts of sources, which we won't go into, but some are involved, you know, gold fillings from prison war camps, you know, con concentration camps. And he had a load of stuff, apparently. And they were, they were just about to bail out uh, to run away from the Russians. And they were right next to a, a concentration camp. I can't remember the name, but we went, we went and visited it while we were there on the job. And, um, the story was that he he boxed all this gold and platinum and stuff up and uh, got some of the prisoners from the uh, concentration camp. And they blew up a load of inflatable dinghies and he said to the the prisoners, right, you go out, out over there, um, straight out over there where we, we, we show you and and you drop all those boxes over the side. Well, it's only a shallow lake, you know, it's well, 10, 15 metres where they dropped the stuff. If they dropped it and um he uh, he then ordered his troops to shoot all the people in the inflatables and sink all the stuff down to the seabed and kill all the people which wasn't a very nice thing to do obviously um the, st the story lived on for years and my my philosophy on that is if i lived in late stopsy or one of the surrounding towns and that that story was true then me and about uh, probably a hundred other people that have heard the same thing would have been out there looking for the stuff yeah. you know not you know 29 boxes of um, gold and platinum would not stay there and i said that from the start but again you know i think well yeah i'd like to do that and uh, go and go with my mate there and uh, um we went out there and did it, two, two trips out there uh, did the survey with the uh, magnetometer um and the sonar which was done by uh, adrian was um, did the a preliminary trip out there and did most of the survey work i went out there to do the diving royal, Ge uh, uh, royal Ge geographic um that they, they were filming it there was a big film crew there and filming this guy and the treasure hunt and everything and filming us there but it never got aired i don't think because uh and there, there was a, a funny enough this was a few years ago but I um I got in touch with the the girl. There was a, a Swedish girl that um, was um, the underwater cameraman, and what a girl she was! It was freezing cold. It was the middle of winter, black as pitch. You know, you couldn't really see anything down there, muddy. And she had a dry suit that leaked, and a big camera. And all she could do was come down with me and hang on my shoulder and just point the camera over the shoulder. And she actually got some footage. But she, her suit was full of water and she was freezing cold, but she stuck it out. And I had a tremendous <laughs> right. amount of respect for her. And I was in touch with her lately because I heard a story that they did actually air, a National Geographic, sorry, 
um, uh, they they aired the program, but I, I've never seen it, and I don't think it was aired because I think there was a bit of falling out with the Israeli guy or something. I don't know, but it was good fun to go and do it. Um, we thought we had an ideal target, you know, on the sonar, which looked just like a group of boxes, but it was a group of rocks just sticking out of the mob. You know, just and they just we called it the, the contact the gingerbread man because it looked like you know, um, but great fun. And uh, again, you know, I wouldn't have missed it for anything, but you know, it was, it was good fun. But that's, 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 just, that's just one of many projects. I mean, I've done all sorts of projects all over the world, really, um, on wrecks and projects, and some that you think, well, this is a load of nonsense, and other others that have produced. A lot of stuff so you know some of the wrecks we worked around the world in the cape verde for instance cape verde are masses of stuff um we found there and, and you know the east coast of florida i was over there and, and philippines indonesia a few other places so i've been lucky really i count my blessings because you know what a what a great i wouldn't swap anything really i mean i'm just glad that I went the direction I, I did because I, I first when I first left school I went to nautical college to go go to sea as a navigator and that's what I did you know for for a short time but then I I realised that diving was for me really well yeah I mean you found all this behind us like Craig said this is this is two pictures from your museum and uh, I think we'll we'll talk about that in a minute but um, Craig just touched on it there the the yeah. other stuff that you do. Yeah, yeah. So, so we we have a uh, a logo here for a very good reason. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. life boat. Yeah. Uh, because you spent thirty eight years, um, besides being underwater, of being you know, doing an incredible service on top of the water uh, as a lifeboatman on the Isle of Wight. Tell us about that and and uh, how it came about. Because you must have started as a kid. I did, yeah. Um, and basically, again, because I was in the right place, you know, I literally, if you look out of my window behind me, I'm 150 yards, you know, you can see the lifeboat peer out the window. We, we live on the seafront here. And yeah, we, we know, we're, we're sitting in your museum, so, so we know how close you are. <laughs> 150, 150 metres away is the lifeboat pier. Well, when I was a kid, I lived up the road about two or 300 yards. And, you know, in those days, you know, the, with the old lifeboats, um, they, you know, the Maroons get used to go off. You might remember this uh, from where, you know, where you might have been in your earlier days. But the Maroons went off and there were these big bangs and then everybody knew the lifeboat was going out. Well, as a kid, I spent nearly all my time either in the water or in dinghies fishing. And I had a dinghy, you know, right from when I was about 10, I suppose. And um, I was, you know, I was pretty obsessed with the lifeboat. I'd run down there and see what was going on. And Unfortunately, the, the, the cox on the lifeboat at that time was a great guy called Peter Smith. And uh, he sort of took me under his wing because, um, you know, I, I didn't have a brilliant relationship with my father. And, and uh, Peter Smith was, was, you know, a real mentor to me. And what he taught me about boats and everything was just irreplaceable, really. And I'll always be grateful for that. But because he knew that I was keen on the lifeboat, you know, from an age of about 11 or 12, he thought, ah, slave labour. Because <laughs> they, they, the old lifeboats, we've, we've actually got the lifeboat. We got, uh, we got that, I got that same lifeboat back from the Imperial War Museum um, in 2016, the, the same one that I was cleaning the brass on and I started on in, in 1960. The first trip I ever did on it was about 1963, I think. And the first service trip was when I was 16, just before I went to sea. Um, I did my first rescue trip on it, you know, in that same boat. We, we've actually got it back now. and We've got three old lifeboats here. Um, Rowan one, the oldest Rowan, my r and I one. Um, but he was he was great to me. But I, I did a lot of work. I cleaned all the brass and there was a lot of brass on that boat. Uh, but I loved it, you know, because I, I, it was great. And as a reward, you know, I'd be taken out on any little regattas, uh, regatta trips or, or um, you know, ex exercises or whatever. And um, it just was a natural progression that when, you know, when I uh, got a, a little bit older, that I was joined the crew. And uh, I was away a little bit, you know, in the North Sea and that. But 
whenever I was back, I was still part of the crew. Um, and it, that led on to various positions on the boat. Then in 1985, I became second coxswain uh and then coxswain in 1994 um so yeah i did a long time on there but you, you're serving with a really good bunch of people and it's changed a lot now it's changed an enormous amount now because uh you know the, the demands on the volunteers are much more than they were i mean basically in the old days you, you know if you heard the maroons go off you went down there but obviously with modern times you, you have to have courses and uh, health and safety and you know, first aid, I've forgotten how many first aid courses I did. <laughs> but, but yeah, you it, mentioned, Martin, you mentioned going back, those guys in the old rowing style boats, they were a fantastic. different breed of, on their own. They're fantastic people. And uh, that's partially that we talked about that anchor that um, I've just brought up this week. And, uh, you know, that is relative to a rescue they did in 1916. Uh, that anchor came off the wreck that's visible just off Foreland here at low tides you can just see a bit sticking out where they they rescued 110 people off that ship mm -hmm. and that was with a rowing lifeboat the coxswain mm -hmm. had, he injured his hand old john holbrook and badly injured it and yet he went back three times to get everybody off the ship including the ship's cat and and the dog um they were incredible people and and what inspired me as well was that um you know i i um at that time lived right next door the, the house we moved into with my parents was one of the famous old actual family that were involved with the lifeboat and their their father was the coxswain the famous coxswain there in the rowing boat days and his brother lived next door well they were old men when i was a boy but they mm -hmm. told me all these fascinating stories about how they went out and they were soaking wet from the outset you know and they go out for hours on end rowing and you know rowing into a storm and you know what we did in modern times with lifeboats is absolutely insignificant in comparison to what those old guys did when they used to go out there and run. All right, nowadays you might get a bit wet and you might get bumped around a bit, but you've got two big engines underneath you, you know, which will drive you where you want to go. But they that what they did was incredible. I wrote a book about it, um, about the local station. It's um, it's on the shelf. And they sell it in the uh, in the R and I shop down there. Uh, and the Let's mention the title to that, Martin. That's the the history of Benbridge Lifeboat. You you were the author of. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, Benbridge Lifeboat Station. Yeah, um, but um, yeah, that was about three years ago, four years ago now that I wrote that. But it's um, you know, it tells all the stories about how fantastic those old guys were and what they did. And you know, to me, that was inspirational as a teenager. And that's why I wanted to get involved. And I, I was involved for a, a long time. And obviously when I gave up the, uh, the North Sea and that, then I became more involved. And that's when, you know, I became second cop. I was working wrecks and salvage, modern salvage up here. So it was ideal because I was around quite a lot of the time. Um, and yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. You know, it was good, very satisfying if you do a decent rescue. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, uh, yeah, you, you sound very modest about it, but 38 years and you must have saved so many people. You know, it's a hell of a service to, to give people. Um, and I believe you were awarded something for it, were you? Oh, well, you weren't going to mention it. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got well, it. We've got to mention it, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, I was fortunate enough to get the MBE for it. Um, and, um, yeah, I was very grateful. But the, the sad thing for me for that was that, you know, I worked with a team, uh, you know, my crew, you know, the crew that worked with me were a really good bunch of guys and uh, and the shore helpers. To me, everybody was the same importance. You know, people used to sometimes say, oh, well, you know, he's, he's a launcher or, or whatever. The launcher, you know, the launcher is the man or the man who knocks the pin out of the boat because we're a slipway station here. Um, and you go down the slipway, you can't launch a boat without him. And they're mm -hmm. just important. And it's, uh, I always said that, you know, it's like cogs in a wheel. You know, it's like, you, take a, you take a cog out, doesn't matter which cog it is, then the, the system doesn't work. And I would have been much happier if I could have divided up that MBE into 30 bits and given a bit to all the team because it's a team, team, teamwork thing. You know? And they were a good bunch. I made a, a video 
of all the rescues we'd done to, uh, over the years. And I gave them all a copy when I retired because I thought if I give them a bottle of whiskey, it'd be gone next week or tomorrow, yeah. or tomorrow in some cases. <laughs> That's a but nice memento. To retire, did you? Sorry? You didn't want to retire. I think you were. Well, you, you yeah. Yeah, well, you had to retire at 55 then, but they, it's funny because I was trialing the new, the new design of lifeboat, which is the Tamar, and I was trialing the prototype. And I took the uh, then director of the RLI out um, for a trip on it from Poole. And he said, uh, We, you know, we've had a couple of complaints from your crew that uh, they say you're fitter than they are, and you're much older than they are, but you're still much fitter. Which you know, diving does that, doesn't it? At the end of the day, and they and we've thought about this thing about the age limit, and we've decided to to um, extend it now on a year to year medical. And this was about three or four weeks before I'm about to go. I've organised all sorts of things. You know, I've got trips, lecturing on cruise liners, and <laughs> all sorts of things. And I said to him, I said, look, I've loved doing what I've done, but I've done a long time, and at, at the end of the day. How would it feel for if you're if the bloke that knows that he's getting the job when I go, I suddenly say, "Oh, guess what?" Yeah, by they, the way, <laughs> yeah. By the way, they've just changed. The director said that I can stay, you know, and uh, I do a year. To, I couldn't do that to them, and you know, at the end of the day, you couldn't do that. It'd be so unfair. So, <laughs> I thought, no, I'll just go and do my trips. <laughs> We, yeah. Which I think brings us on nicely to the view behind Fridge and I in that all the salvage you've done and, and uh, the, the, the exploration of wrecks you have accumulated over the years, an incredible collection of artifacts and, and uh, stuff that you've pulled up. Uh, and you founded the Shipwreck and Maritime Centre uh, as far back as 1978. Eight was that, Martin? Yeah, it was uh, 1970. Well, in 77, I, I lived in a, a house in the village before I lived here. And um, I couldn't get in the door, basically. And I had so much stuff in there. And I thought, it's a bit selfish to to keep it all. Even It's nice to look at. I mean, I've got a few bits in the house here, but not a not a huge amount. It's nearly all in the museum or in storage, you know, waiting for more space for the museum to change the space. So in 77, I thought, I've got to do something here. And wouldn't it be nice to set up a little museum? And I was in the North Sea at the time. So it was an ideal time. You know, I had a bit of spare money. And uh, this little bakery, uh, I, funnily enough, I worked there. It was a sort of grocer's store, in a, like a Victorian grocer's store. I didn't work there in Victorian times, so I hasten to add. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> there was an old baker there. And, as uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had to work uh, to, you know, uh, all the stuff that we did as kids, our little jobs, you know, went towards the, the family. You know, I had a paper round, I had a milk round. I worked in the bakery uh, at the weekends, you know, early mornings. Then I'd deliver the bread on this big bike, carrier bike with a box in the front. Anyway, that old bakery had, um, had, gone, it had gone derelict because the, the owners were old. And... Uh, we just thought, well, that'd make a perfect little museum. So we sort of got the place in 77, converted it into, you know, the Bembridge Maritime Museum. Then we were there 28 years before we moved to where you've got the pictures behind you in Ariton. Um, and it was an ideal way because, you know, it's pretty selfish to have all this history kicking around in your, your own house when the public would probably love to see it. And they do love to see it. You know, they love to read the stories you know, particularly things like the Sawfish and the Mendy, you know, the Mendy in particular, because it's such a poignant wreck. Um, so that's what happened. And, um, you know, it started off pretty small, but then it, it sort of um, it, grew yeah, a bit. It, it, it grew and grew until I didn't have an, enough space in Bembridge and the parking was no good. Um, so we had to move, basically. I didn't want to move, but... Uh, we had to move to somewhere where there was parking and uh, more space to put things. And what you see behind you, we had another barn. I think I told you about this. We had another barn the same size, full of stuff. You know, a lot of that stuff I've had to store now because we've only got the one barn, um, you know, one part of the museum there. So all the all the diving, commercial diving masks and, and history through years, you know, we've got to try and 
rotate the displays to do that. So that's how it started. And um, yeah, it was good. And uh, it gradually grew and grew. And uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely to see the comments from people that have actually come in and enjoyed reading the story and being educated about shipwrecks and about artifacts from the bottom of the sea. So, you yeah. know, I, I get a lot of pleasure out of people enjoying it, really. Uh, and you're still doing it now, aren't you? You're still picking up stuff and collecting stuff now. As Like we said right at the beginning, as, as two days ago, you were, three days ago, you were picking up the anchor out of the... Yeah, uh, big old anchor. I was up there this morning. We took it up to the yard this morning to for restoration, conservation. But, you know, every little... Every little bit tells a story. I mean, some of my people say to me, oh, I bet you love finding all those gold coins and silver coins. And yeah, I've been lucky. I've found a lot of that sort of stuff, but it doesn't really do much for me apart from it's very nice to find. And, and I'm, I'm not being blase about that. I like to find it. And, you know, but a coin, you know, I've got coins here, like these pieces of eight, you know, like this. You know, And a piece of eight has got a lot of history to it and i found quite a lot of them over the years but it's a coin it went from you to you to me to someone else whereas if you get something that someone made you know like like i've got some little bits here you know little things this is one of the what not valuable little, can you see that it's a little cannon look wow. yeah yeah little cannon now that tells a story because i was on the seabed once on a, a wreck which has got very strange things about this one wreck out of hundreds and it, it, coincidences if you want to call it that and i i was down there on the seabed and i thought ah i was tying up to an iron cannon because there were few, few, some iron cannons it was quite an old wreck about 1700 and i thought wow why are they why are they any bronze cannons on this wreck you know i'm fed up of iron ones I've got loads of those but um i want to find some bronze ones couple of minutes later literally within five minutes i find this little where is where's the camera on here you see this it's shrunk yeah. a bit though hasn't it it's a Just little <laughs> tiny tiny little yeah and it's almost like someone taking the mickey out of me why is a bronze camera just bring that closer to the camera move, just move that and then up just so that people can can yeah. actually see, see that, that. Uh, yeah and i'll, I'll turn it's it over in that i turned it over look can you see that? Yeah. And yeah. Um, and look in the end. And someone made that on that ship. And all that remains of that ship is a few bits of, and pieces. But someone had made a model of the ship they were on. And it, over the course of the next few years, when I, I dived there quite a lot in that, uh, that area, I found 16 of those. Wow. 16 of those. And they were all to scale to the, the actual guns of the ship. So they were this, they were all scaled and they were turned on a little lathe because they're not cast because you see there, there's a little slot there. You see that slot? Yeah. And that's a little bit of brass wire in there. I mean, if it was cast, it would have the trunnions, you know, the bits that it swiveled on. It would yeah. be part of the, of the cast. But then someone turned those and you could see the little, the little dimple on the end where they obviously held it on a little hand lathe or something. Yeah. To me, is 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 yeah. you know rather than a, a shipwreck coin you yeah. know and you you were kind enough to send us a dvd which is actually a walk around of the museum uh, yeah. and one thing that's clearly obvious when you watch that is the 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 amount of spread of material because you've got from pirate days and pieces of eight right through to the, the early diving gear that can be seen behind me here. But then the, the First World War wrecks and the ship's bells and the telegraphs and stuff that's really personal to to particular ships that, that you found. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's funny because one of the things on the worksheet um, that we give to the kids, you know, it's like a, a little worksheet they can do, is how many bells can you count in the museum? Well, I even I didn't know that, but I think there's... <laughs> 32 or something <laughs> ship spells you've ruined it now we're going to come and see you martin and oh, yeah. you can us that work well, you're, you're, just... you're, you're too old to do the worksheet but <laughs> but yeah the, the 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 stuff is amazing i mean and it i it really hurts me to have stuff in storage because i want it all out on 
on display so people can learn from it you know and, and it's like the, the the diving gear we were talking about i've got all the old um north sea type helmets aquadine helmets you know the old cb gorman uh, all that and, and people learn from it you know but it is sad to have um lost that other bomb we had because um you know it was all on display before but but look at this look can you see that yeah gold. yeah that. Is it? You talk about how long things have been underwater. That's exactly as I picked it up. It's a gold coin, and it's dated thirteen hundred and something. You know, and and that's as it came up. It's amazing stuff. Gold. You know, silver is not the same. Silver, you'll get. You know, I mean, look, look at that. Look at that. Look inside that rock. There's a a, a silver oh. coin crudded in. Look. You know, completely encased. Whereas gold coins, you pick them up. It's like someone had. Dropped it over yesterday. Look, I show people this on on cruise ships and say, "What do you think this is? You know, what does it look like? A rock. Turn it over and look what's encased in it. You know, it's, a, it's a, one of the more modern pieces of eight, the pillar dollars. Wow. So, you know, you learn you learn something from all this stuff. I mean, I I, I never stop learning. I mean, I, I I read books. I'm not a television person at all. I love books. And I've got hundreds and hundreds of books and anything I can learn, um, you know, even you, if, if you can learn 1% of something from someone else, you know, it's another 1% you didn't know. And that's important, I think, that you've got to keep educating yourself because yeah, yeah, you, only get one, you only get one uh, it's Just It's absolutely fascinating. I, I mean, we want to come and visit your museum um soon as we're able to and we can get the time in the new year and it's safe to do so i think we're definitely coming over to the isle of wight to come and see you and come up with a loose plan to go and find something martin yeah, yeah. atlantis again hey? I'll, I'll give you the directions i'll say it's over there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one little story i was going to tell you about the middle east about working out there and the difference with that in the north sea was um we we used to have to do whatever you know and, um a lovely story i remember we had the uh, south south so louisiana barge crew you know the barge captain it was a big mcdermott crane barge i was on uh, one of the ones and um he uh we had a french barge there and, and we worked on a big blowout on a um a, something called the l3 it, it um this rig just blew out and exploded and fortunately they got uh, virtually everybody off before it blew up there was only three killed i think which was three too many um and and uh the next thing that happened was um it was a they they had to try and drill directional drill down into the well that the the rig was above because the rig had just dis, uh, disintegrated burnt out and there was just this huge bubble of burning gas you know come to the surface at hydrogen sulfide so they they set up a, a another couple of jack up rigs to try and drill to pump cement and sludge down there to seal the well to stop it, it, it uh, you know all this um, thick fire that they had to keep burning because it was hydrogen sulfide big oil field there it would have gassed everybody and um, next thing there was a storm blew up and and the, this I've got the actual pictures of how it happened and this this drill barge um which was an anchored drill barge not a jack up just broke its moorings and came in and smacked this uh, jack up called the wd kent knocked it over and the thing went down and sank well fortunately they got, they got, all the crew got off because there were supply boats backed up and they all got off and then our next job was to cut that rig up on the seabed um and that was quite a a, a job you know because it was we were we were diving 190 190 foot of of um water at that time and we're doing it on scuba nearly every day you know i mean and, and because you know it's like as we all know nitrogen narcosis you know depletes the more you do it the more deep diving you do on air the less you suffer and uh, it's like drinking whiskey if you don't drink whiskey you'll get drunk after a couple of glasses but if you drink whiskey well anyway we would we would pop in down ev virtually every day you know my logbooks prove that and 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 then we had a another barge captain there that was installing a french barge an etm barge etpm barge and they were installing a structure and they used to drill down in the inside the legs to um 
uh, to put the stamp piles in, you know, to to uh, anchor the thing down. And they they often lost these drill bits inside the legs. Well, we we got a call one day, or the barge captain got a call, and uh, this Frenchman said, "Oh, he said uh, we have a problem here." He said, "Have you got a tool for extracting drill bits from inside rig legs, two hundred foot down?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "We call them divers." He said, "How many do you want?" <laughs> <laughs> and apparently the, the the divers on board had refused to go down in these legs and uh, they were three foot legs they were quite big um we've been doing two like 30 inch piles you know getting down i've got pictures of me going down inside you know with the kirby on um right down to i, I get drill bits out you know but people it, there's nothing down there going to hurt you because you know i mean it's encapsulated you go down and you just wriggle around and try and get a, a wire on the on the drill bit and get it out and we thought this was luxury going over to this other <laughs> other part of a three foot part they ran the divers off they, they they were off on the next chop i think because they wouldn't go down there wow it was just that one comment that always stuck in my mind when this Frenchman <laughs> asked have you got a tool to get it i mean we could talk all night about diving and and, and yeah. you literally yeah. so fascinating can I ask Martin? We've mentioned it twice. Can we finish with the story of the Mindy? Because yes. it's it's an incredible story that very little people know about, and more people will be will, will look into it when they hear a little bit from you about that wreck. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, the Mindy it was um, it, it was a, a, an elder Dempster ship, and uh, and. Um, it was, well, I say Elder Dempster, it ended up as an Elder Dempster ship. It was uh, originally uh, the South, uh, it was the S and, and what was it? The South, um, it'll come back to me in a minute. But it was, it was like a, a cargo liner, you know, passenger cargo ship that um, in, the, in the war, in the First World War, it was, um, it was sort of um, requisitioned to go and carry troops from South Africa back up to the uh, the French trenches so they because South Africa had offered to um, send people from there to, uh, for the trench warfare a lot of the people from the townships of Soweto uh, they uh, they volunteered or they were volunteered if you like um, I'm, I'm not quite sure which but a lot of them who never seen the sea in their life were suddenly on a voyage from South Africa up to England uh, and on to the Havre to uh, be taken off um, and used. They weren't allowed to carry a gun, by the way, because the old, uh, you know, the old apartheid type uh, attitude at that time. They were frightened that they would shoot the officers or whatever, uh, um, and that's a very sad thing in itself. But they were used for digging trenches, uh, driving duties, you know, um, catering duties, whatever. Um, Anyway, the Mendy left South Africa, came up, dropped uh, some things off in, in Plymouth and then carried on up channel on February the 17th, um, uh, February, the, uh, February, February the 20th, I think it was 1917. And it was a dark, foggy night. Uh, they, they throttled back on the engines to proceed cautiously in the fog and then got run down by a, a, a bigger ship called the Darrow in the fog who was going too fast basically traveling very fast he was yeah he was he was going very uh, he hadn't reduced speed anyway the mendy was sliced virtually in half and a lot of the troops were down in the uh, in the holds and they well they didn't survive they're basically out of out of 800 and something people on board 646 people um went down in the wreck uh the, the the really heartrending story of that that was there was a reverend on board um called R uh, reverend uh Washopi, and uh he got the um troops up he was obviously with them uh, uh, from the townships as well of south africa Soweto, and uh he got them up on deck and as the ship went under apparently he said come on my brothers doesn't matter what tribe you're from we're zulus we're uh uh, whatever you know um we do the death dance together and they took their shoes off on deck and 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 danced the death dance as the ship went down 
um, and 646 people died. The weird thing about it is, as I said earlier, that I'd researched all the wrecks around the Isle of Wight. You know, it was something I did when I was in saturation in the North Sea. I took my my books with me and uh, and and researched as much as I could about what was out there that hadn't been found. But the thing was, I'd never heard of the Mendy, which was weird because I knew, you know, virtually all the other wrecks there. And um, so when I found this wreck, there was a, you know, there was a vague report on one of the old Admiralty surveys that there was a barge, you know, Admiralty barge, you know, dumb barge lost in that sort of area. And I thought, well, I'll go and have a look at that because it looks a bit big on the echo sounder to be a barge. And when I dived in, obviously, it was this ship, you know, which was a good quality ship, um, some incredible fittings on there, you know, sliding brass window, much better than a normal coastal merchant ship. And I picked up a little saucer, which is in that cabinet behind you, <laughs> if you were there. <laughs> and um, it had on there uh, B and A S N C uh, on the crest, which is what I was trying to think of just now. British, British and African steam navigation company little crest so i thought ah oh, that's going to give me a clue uh, not always because sometimes you get into ship contamination of things you know and uh, you get led out down a false trail but when i went back and i looked it up um i thought this can only be a ship called the mendy and then i started researching it and unraveled this incredible story about 646 people dying right off our island and none of us knew about it. You know, it's absolutely mind-boggling that this had happened. Now, whether it's because, you know, they didn't value the people in the way they should have done in those days because they were coloured, or whether it was a, uh, they were frightened of giving the, um, the Germans a bit of a propaganda boost because this big loss of life, you know, the people that were going to go and fight them in the trenches. But these, you know, these people, you know, they... They'd never even seen the sea, and there they are floundering around in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter in February. Um, you know, it was tragic. It was absolutely a heartrending story, really. Um, and it, it touched me because, you know, unraveling that story, I mean, over the years, it's grown and grown because uh, when I first said about it, this was back in 1974, I found the wreck. And... Um, you know, various delegations came over. You know, we had people like Zulu princes, you know, from the townships coming over and um, we would take them out there and lay wreaths and things like that. Um, but it grew and grew until uh, on the the um, centenary, which was uh, in 2017, um, they sent up a South African warship with all the military bands and uh, relatives of the uh, people who died on there. And uh, there was a you know, big memorial service at the uh, Millbrook Cemetery in Portsmouth and Hollybrook, Southampton, where Princess Anne attended all the dignitaries, the, you know, the um, ambassadors and everything. And we, then we went out on this warship and laid wreaths over the site. So it was all very touching. And, and you know, to, to have been responsible for that was, you know, was a special moment for me because if I hadn't found the wreck and identified it, then it wouldn't have happened all this stuff. And and a couple of years ago, we went down to South Africa and um, I'd made a point, we, we were going on a, on a trip, I made a point of organizing uh, the fifth generation granddaughter of that reverend uh, who's now married to a, a, um, you know, a diplomat um, in Swaziland, came and picked us up, we went up to um, uh, Johannesburg and she came and picked us up took us out to the townships to meet the relatives or the descendants oh. of the people that were lost and the, the, we even went in the reverend's house they still got the same house that the reverend had you know back in 1917 so it was a very poignant story and, and it's one that should be remembered for forever really because those people were coming to give their lives you know for the war effort the allied war effort and they weren't allowed to carry a gun, you know, which was yeah, pretty appalling in those days. But fortunately, things have changed now. Yeah, well, I didn't want to end without mentioning that because the difference that you've made in your, that find to the descendants of the people on that ship is actually enormous that that should be recognised and all of those things that happened. 
because you found that wreck. So I didn't want to us to finish and Fridge and I to, to chat about the Mendy afterwards. And so yeah. why, why did we not bring up the Mendy? We had to, you know, no. close that one. It's, that and the swordfish are the two most significant ones in my mind because there's the human element, the human story, and and the relationships you build with the people who are involved, you know, the descendants who are involved. And that, yeah. that brings it alive to me because, you know, maybe I'm a bit of a softy, but I, I just, I like to get the human element out of any wreck. Any wreck I ever found, uncharted, I would do my utmost to to find... Uh, anybody who was still surviving that w was on that wreck or even someone's son who you know that could tell the story and you get the story from the horse's mouth and there's one particular very short one i can tell you it was a, a ship called the warwick deeping i found that back in the late 70s uh, completely uncharted untouched and it was one of the most intact wrecks around here. you don't get intact wrecks around here because the tidal um yeah and the, and the weather conditions you know they tend to batter them a lot and uh, this one was pretty intact because it was Second World War. And I actually managed to track down, you'll see in the picture behind this, there's all the builder's plates from the Warwick Deeping and the bell and the compass. But I tracked down the guy on the on the binnacle in the, in, the, um, in the display case in the museum. There's a little brass wheel and everybody thinks it's a steering wheel, but it's not. It, it actually turned, it was an anti-submarine requisition trawler. So it had uh, depth charges on and it turned the Asdic wheel uh, the Aztec dome on the bottom underneath yeah yeah so that wheel just turned the Aztec dome and i tracked down this old hull trawlerman uh, that was actually on 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 board and he was uh, one of the survivors of the wreck and uh, he told me the whole story about how the uh, german surface raiders fired torpedoes at them but because they'd been out for a few days the uh, Warwick Deep had been out she was quite light because she was needing to go in and get fuel and provisions and everything torpedoes went underneath so these surface raiders then sunk her by gunfire and the the crew got in a boat and they were about five miles off the land and uh they rowed in to the back of the island and this this trawler was telling me the story and he said we went to a farm it was like a farm cottage when we got ashore we went dragged the boat up the beach and went up there and knocked on the door and someone said what do you want and uh, they said oh we've been shipwrecked and uh you know off here we've been sh the, the ship's been sunk by the germans and they opened the door and, and and they said can we come in we're cold and we're wet and they said you're not coming in here you'll ruin my carpet <laughs> and that's what he told me it's a true story so they went down the road and found the Albion hotel down the road and they let them in <laughs> we've gone through a shipwreck they, they've been gunned out of the water by by germans probably a u-boat i i suspect and, and this lady says no you're going to ruin my carpet yeah, it was oh. the, it was the surface uh surface craft the e-boats that it was an e -boat. yeah yeah well yeah. we're based on a on a seasonal um story there there was no room at the inn was there yeah. <laughs> no, there was room at the inn but not in her house <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, and to me, every time I look at those items from the Warwick Deeping, it reminds me of that story and that lovely old trawlerman that told me the story. He said, if you'd known how many times I turned that wheel, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so when does the museum open? Is it around April time, uh, COVID yeah. permitting? Yeah, COVID permitting, it'll be... Um, Helen, my wife, was um, uh, sort of trying to organise all that, you know, opening days uh, subject to... And it'll be the end of March. We're always open pretty much, you know, right at the end of March. And I think Easter is about the first week in April. So it'll be open about um, probably the 29th, 30th March or something like that. Well, we've got the website details there. Between now and then, everyone should jump on the website because you've got some fantastic images there. Um, the images behind me and Fridge are from your website, and there's a lot more there as well. So you can get your juices flowing in anticipation of visiting the Island of Wight in April. Oh, well, that's good. I'd, I'd love, we'd love to see anybody. I mean, I, I go there and clean the brass and that, and uh, but you know, I'm still prioritising on the diving, so. If I'm busy on the diving, I won't be at the museum. If anybody actually wanted to make a point of getting in touch, then I would do my best to be there subject to work. But even at my ripe old age, I, I still consider my day-to-day -day job the priority, <laughs> which is 
Okay. Underwater labouring, if you like. <laughs> well, well, Fridge and I aren't coming unless we know you're there to give us the go. I make a point of that. You know that. Look, as soon as we're, as soon as it's safe to do so, I'll, I'll speak for Craig as well. Is I'm sure we're going to come down to the Isle of Wight and come and have a look around the museum, catch up with you. You can make us that cup of tea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's been good to talk, and uh, you know, be glad to see you when you come down. Yeah, and to, for us, Martin, we really appreciate your time. It's been great to have a chat and hear just a, a little skim of some of the stories that uh, of your lifetime of diving and, and your 38-year career with the lifeboats. And, and the well-deserved MBE from the Queen's Honours List in 2004. I know it's very much a team effort, but you deserved what you got. No, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, definitely come and see us when you come down. We're looking forward to it and thank you so much and, and we look forward to catching up. Yep, do that and uh, stay safe and uh, be well. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you, Martin. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.